What is going on, everybody? Welcome into my Week 9 NFL Power Rankings, reflecting upon a pretty wild and almost inexplicable slate of Week 8 action. A lot of big movement and fun movement that we're going to talk about here throughout the next 20, 30 minutes or so. I do want to ask, before we get started, please do hit that like button down below. It really does help me out, helps support the channel. So I appreciate you in advance. Also, just a note, no Monday Night Football being reflected in the rankings here. I do plan on breaking down the game and showing any rankings adjustments during the Fully Inflated Football podcast that will be out on Wednesday here on the channel and your audio podcast platforms wherever you get your podcast so make sure you come back subscribe and check out the show for any monday night football breakdowns from chiefs and giants but let's go ahead and get started at the bottom the houston texans have rightfully returned to the bottom of these rankings it's it's getting worse and worse by the week it really does feel that way they trade away mark ingram this week that seems to be the lifeblood of that locker room and just nothing really to speak of this week. Getting slaughtered, coming in, scoring some garbage time points, hoping to get Tarod Taylor back here soon to at least make this team a little bit more watchable. But yeah, it's it's bad and gonna be bad here for a while. And then the Detroit Lions at 31. You can preach that underdog mentality all you want, but the reality is this team has lost its bite. And this week, against the Philadelphia Eagles, just getting absolutely obliterated off the ball in the line of scrimmage and just not competitive at all against an Eagles team that's not even that good. So I actually have the Texans and Lions in their own bottom feeding tier here for the NFL, but that doesn't let these other teams off the hook. And that starts with the Jacksonville Jaguars starting off our next tier at uh, my 30th spot here. I thought this team would come out with a little bit more energy, coming off the win, coming off the bye week, getting to play a Seattle team that they could have matched up with. They had the better quarterback in this game, and man, just flat, uninspiring, all around, back to square one here. Everything we said about Urban Meyer not bringing any sort of tone setting here, and sure as hell isn't bringing any sort of schematic X's and O's benefit to Trevor Lawrence and these guys, so... You know, if the team wasn't afraid of Urban Meyer trying to cheat on his wife again on the way home and protecting him from that, they probably shouldn't have even let him get on the plane ride home. Wouldn't be surprised if uh, Urban Meyer is no longer coaching this team by the time you're here in this video here on Monday morning. Uh, but yeah, ugly, ugly week for the Jacksonville Jaguars. One of the more disappointing outcomes of the week. Then the New York Jets, one of the least disappointing outcomes of the week for Jets fans. The Jets have one of the more interesting resumes right now because they have some of the worst losses out there as early as last week where they got just slaughtered by the New England Patriots. But now they come out, beat the Cincinnati Bengals. They have beaten the Titans. They've shown some flashes in there. And most notably, it is the identity of this team being that defensive line. And the way Robert Salah is able to get these guys schemed up as well. They have talent, but they also are playing really well inside this, this scheme and in the, in the way that they can stunt guys up front with all these big athletic dudes, Rankins, Franklin Myers, uh, Quinn and Williams, you name it. And they took advantage of the Bengals offensive line. They had a clear cut advantage in that matchup and it changed the landscape of the game. So good for the New York Jets picking up a win We'll learn as we go how much they can build off of that, uh, but they get their second win on the season. And how about Mike White making some plays in the offense as well? Kind of, uh, I would just say clicking on all cylinders more than they have at any point on the season. I don't know how much of that is Mike White or not. Uh, I guess we'll find out Thursday Night Football. Okay, Miami Dolphins at 28. Not much really to add to this team that we haven't said already, but this offense just fails to, to move. Uh, they've got two offensive coordinators and no identity, a quarterback that can't carry this team, and an offensive line that is an utter liability. So more of the same there. The defense did their best to keep this team in the game, but uh, just unable to get the job done. So uh, an ultra disappointing season for the Miami Dolphins. And then number 27 here, the Washington football team, another ultra disappointing 
team here, a, a playoff team last year that just has not been able to build off of any momentum that they had last year. Granted, it was kind of a fake playoff team after winning the NFC least with like six or seven games or whatever it is. But the fact that this defense has gotten worse, the offense under Heineke, it's just simply put one of the worst in the league. And you do kind of have to start wondering, is Ron Rivera kind of maxed out here? Uh, because they're just not building off of anything right now. And that's going to round out our, you know, tier of true bottom feeders, I would say. Our next tier are more competitive teams with long shot hopes of playoffs, I suppose. Starting with the Philadelphia Eagles, good team win. Come out, dominate the line of scrimmage, get out of Detroit with a blowout win. Jalen Hurts playing probably his most complete game of football on the season. It was the Detroit Lions. Hard to know how much to take away from that, but still good to see a team come out and uh, kick another NFL team's ass like that. So plus two for the Philadelphia Eagles. New York Giants playing on Monday Night Football. Again, we will get a reaction from that game on the podcast on Wednesday. Though I will say, I'm not expecting them to compete all that much. Guess we'll see. Then the Atlanta Falcons at number 24. Definitely one of the most uh, disappointing, disheartening weeks for a fan base out there for the Falcons. You really started off before the game even started with Ridley dealing with some stuff off the field. And he's going to be stepping away from the team. That's a, a huge loss until he comes back. And we don't have a timeline on that. Hopefully, Ridley can... Uh, get things sorted out in, in his life uh, to be in the right frame of mind to get back with the team, of course, but it is a blow to this team either way you want to slice it. And then for Matt Ryan to come out and just play like absolute ass. I mean, he was pathetic this week. Uh, bad interceptions, just creating nothing, not using Kyle Pitts. It was all around uh, a terrible performance from the Atlanta Falcons and a massive step backwards after you know, taking a step forward over the last couple weeks. So tough to see that for Falcons fans that thought this team was building something. They're back to square one right now. Then the Panthers beating the Falcons this week as underdogs. Uh, getting Gilmore in there this week. This defense coming back together a little bit. Hoping to get Saquon Barkley back here soon because this offense has been so tough to watch since he got injured. Darnold, P.J. Walker, it hasn't mattered. Uh, so... You know, the, the hype train has cooled off on the Panthers, but at least they have a heck of a defense on that team. Then the Chicago Bears, going to stay put at number 22. Justin Fields had his best game by far. Starting to get a little bit more comfortable within this offense, and uh, that's definitely optimistic. And it's kind of at that point for the Bears where that's what you want to see. You want to see Fields getting better week by week and know that you know, you can attract a high level coach and feel good about the future here. But there's a lot of stuff for this team to work out as well. Matt Nagy coming back from COVID here this week, probably not going to be on this team much longer. And this defense just ain't cutting it right now. They've had some flashes this season, but they are in a weird purgatory state where this just isn't a championship defense. And uh, some of the big plays that they gave up this week were really unacceptable for, for a team that you do expect to be much better coached on that side of the ball. So a lot of stuff going on in Chicago, but optimism from Justin Fields this week. Then the Seattle Seahawks plus two, picking up a win with Geno in there. This is really what this was about. Steal a couple wins with Geno Smith in there, a quarterback, and hopefully get Russ back in a few weeks. And then they can talk about sneaking in as that seven seed and then with Russell Wilson in a, in a playoff game you never know what can happen but that's really what this team season is about right now is is starting to play better defense get the run game going uh, have DK Metcalf give you some explosive plays down the field and a uh, big win for them I actually picked the Jags this week and the, and the Seahawks came out and uh, showed why their coaching still has its perks even if it is a little bit outdated <laughs> that uh you know, Seahawks fans are definitely not a fan of, but hey, got the job done this week. Then we've got the Denver Broncos moving up a spot. I don't feel any better about the Broncos this week. I just feel worse about the Atlanta Falcons. So they're moving up. They beat the football team this week. Certainly good to see Jerry Judy get back out there this week. And sure, the defense playing a little bit better against some offenses that are struggling right now. But I mean, come on, where are we going here with the Denver Broncos? Now we have a tier gap up to teams that are much more in the playoff picture, 
but teams that just have a severe lack of either explosiveness offensively or continuity from a week to week standpoint. And actually, this tier is remarkably tight right now, all the way up to 13. And I'm actually going to do something I don't normally do, and I'm actually going to reveal all seven of these teams right now because I want to emphasize that this tier gap I really struggled with. And honestly, if you put these guys in a neutral field, I think you're talking about a point difference between all these teams. But I got to put the Minnesota Vikings at 19. I mean, that was a, a hot seat performance and dare I say a, a fireable offense by this coaching staff for the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, it was a Halloween horror story for this offense that had no excuse playing that way at home Sunday night football against the Dallas Cowboys and, and Cooper Rush. I mean, they played not to lose that game. I tweeted about this. You know the old saying, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And the Vikings decided, you know, we don't really have to push the ball downfield. We're just going to play this game not to lose. We'll escape this game with our defense against a backup quarterback. When in reality, the Vikings offense, when they have played aggressively, has been honestly pretty good. But they protected themselves for what uh, God knows what reason here this week, and they got burnt for it. Uh, no aggressiveness from Kirk Cousins as well. It's not all in the coaching staff. We wanted to see Kirk play on Sunday Night Football, and unfortunately, we, we saw his cousin. Uh, so just an all-around horrific performance from the Minnesota Vikings, losing all of the steam that they had, and that is going to be a, uh, a, a terrible loss by the end of the season when you look back at playoff seedings and stuff. Then the Indianapolis Colts at 18, dropping down two spots, really tough loss for uh, the Colts to swallow. You know, they were actually building a lot here. Wentz was playing better. The team was coming together. They were actually favored by a point in this game. But unfortunately, and I really am not someone that tries to put losses on a quarterback exclusively, but this one was on Carson Wentz. And uh, he, again, he had been playing better lately, but just constantly putting the ball in harm's way in the second half, putting his team in uh, just such compromising situations. And, and you can't have that. So Wentz has to clean that up or this team season is done. And you really need to have some conversations about should this team be benching Carson Wentz so that they're not giving up a first round pick for not for nothing you know um you, you can't have your quarterback playing like that so minus two for the Colts disappointing loss uh, a win there would have gotten them seriously into the playoff mix but now they're pretty far behind as we uh, approach the midway point on the season and then at number 17 I'm sorry Saints fans but it's gonna be you I just look at this team moving forward with Trevor Simeon, and I have a really hard time seeing this team consistently beating other playoff teams. We know this team has great line play, and I do think Sean Payton should be the front runner for Coach of the Year right now, and that was an outstanding win. Um, but if you want my honest opinion, we're going to look back on this game and say Halloween for the New Orleans Saints, upsetting the Tampa Bay Bucks, getting a pick six on Tom Brady. Uh, to, to end the game, that's going to end up being their Super Bowl because that was a very costly win, losing Jameis Winston, who's really starting to build up some momentum there and, and playing good football early on in this game. Uh, so the Saints are going to drop down four because of the quarterback injury, but of course, a really exciting, fun win for the Saints fans. So at least enjoy it while you can for the Saints. Then the Niners at 16. Big win against Da Bears this week. Debo freaking Samuel, man. Uh, I don't know where he ranks receiver-wise. About 100 yards almost on a screen catch. But man, is he one of the most electric players in the NFL, particularly with the ball in his hands. And hey, Jimmy Garoppolo playing really good football in the second half of this game saying, don't forget about me. I can still have some moments. I might not be this superstar, but there is a reason Kyle Shanahan trusts him. And that was an impressive performance by the Niners offense, uh, persevering through a lot of momentum that the Bears had captured in that game. So big win for the Niners to get the offense rolling again. And uh, they're in the mix here and could be interesting if they start to get a little more healthy moving forward. Then the New England Patriots plus three, that was a huge win for the Patriots, man. And we've definitely learned now that these physical teams, the Cowboys, the Ravens, the Patriots that want to run the ball and intimidate you up front, 
those are the teams that are really going to match up well against the LA Chargers specifically. Uh, so that is certainly noteworthy, but the Patriots are playing pretty damn good ball lately, man. They barely lost to the Dallas Cowboys, beating the Chargers here, blowing out the Jets last weekend. They're a solid team, and with the way they're playing right now, I do expect them to be in the mix for a wild card spot. And it's, it's tough because without all of these guys in the secondary, uh, dealing with injuries and trading away Gilmore, I just don't know if the upside for this defense is where it, it has to be for them to be a more serious playoff team. Uh, but they're still incredibly well coached and uh, certainly not a bad football team. Then the Cleveland Browns, Browns fans, I'm really sorry to do this, but man, at some point you gotta, you gotta move the ball offensively and Baker Mayfield just not getting the job done at all. The run game has not been able to get to that dominant status of last year and it, it just comes down to Baker Mayfield. I mean, this defense is playing lights out. Miles Garrett continues to be, in my opinion, the defensive player of the year. He had a, I saw on Twitter, Pass rush win, weight, win rate of 54%. Can't wait to see his PFF pro profile as far as how many pressures he had. He was swarming in this game. And, and the Browns played great defensively. Baker had yet again a chance late in this game, and the team fell short. Now, it wasn't all Baker's fault. There's a lot of drops and stuff. But at the end of the day, this, this team has to figure out the offense if they want us to take them more seriously as a team that can come in and win playoff games. They, they have a great defense. They can do some things offensively, but they're not a great football team right now. They got to they gotta put this all together moving forward. And then somehow the Pittsburgh Steelers end up at 13, and I really don't feel good about this. This is the big reason why I wanted to cluster all these guys together so much. Because again, if the Steelers play the Vikings tomorrow, I don't, know, I don't know who I would pick to win in a neutral field. Like this is a very tight gap. These teams have been very week to week. But the Steelers at least play the most consistent brand of football and kind of know who they are more than any of these teams. And they have the best unit out of anybody in this list, and that is their defense. TJ Watt playing unbelievable. Cam Hayward playing at an elite level. Uh, so up front, they're dominant. And everyone on the back end is building off of that on top of great coaching. So I do really trust this defense. And then offensively, I do think they've kind of hit a strange rhythm in that they've learned. And I, I actually talked about how Juju leaving this team was actually going to be a little bit better for them because it's just one less piece that they have to feel like they need to get involved. I think simplifying this offense and letting the playmakers do the work, Chase Claypool, Deontay Johnson, Pat Fryermuth now emerging as kind of a go-to short to intermediate target. And then, of course, Najee Harris. You just put the ball in their hands, let them make contested catches, create explosive plays with the ball in their hands, and you can generate enough of an offense. This is not an explosive team, and I don't see them winning a Super Bowl. But like I said, they come in at 13 because they've won three straight, and they have an identity as a team. They know what they need to accomplish to win a game. And that is going to give them a chance to beat pretty much anyone in the league. And they comp, um, they came out and got the job done here against the Browns this week. And that's really been their formula over the last month of the season. So it's not all bad, but we know this team has a limited upside with Big Ben. But now we climb up into our next tier here. We're going to have three teams in this tier. And this is a group of teams that are, I consider, playoff caliber teams, but teams that have certain weaknesses that I'd like to point out that uh, are going to make it tough on these teams to be Super Bowl teams, to put together three, four game stretches and actually win a Super Bowl. But I do think these are pretty safely playoff teams and they're actually on the AFC, but it's going to be the Bengals at number 12. And this is one of the biggest beauties of my power rankings. I think uh, something that those of you that do stick around and subscribe for these power rankings every week do appreciate. And that's what the Bengals are another example of this, where last week, Bengals fans come out, get a big win against the Ravens, the biggest win they've had in five years plus. And all of a sudden, I'm a Bengals hater because I don't put them in the top 10 and I have them below the Ravens and all this stuff. And then they come out next week and they lose to the New York Jets. But they're not moving because there is a balance to this. <laughs> there is not these massive overreactions. I still think the Bengals 
are a very good football team moving forward. And it is worth noting that they suffered from one of the worst penalties of the season, if not the worst, on uh, just atrocious, like, uh, what, do they, what do they call it? Um, personal foul for leading with the helmet. It was BS. The, the running back lowered his head into the guy. It should have been on the running back, if anyone. Uh, led to a first down and end of the game. I think the Bengals would have been able to force overtime getting good field position off of that punt. So they did get screwed in this game, but they still were in a position for that to happen to them against the Jets. So no movement for the Bengals. I still think Joe Burrow playing great football. Jamar Chase, uncoverable, one of the best receivers in the NFL, period, not just rookie receivers. Uh, but this was a hiccup week from their defense, I think, a lack of superstar talent could show up for this team and this defense's ability to play consistent ball week to week. Um, but then offensively, that offensive line, we talked about it with the Jets, that group got abused and that's a clear weakness for this team. And in certain matchups, I do think the Bengals are gonna struggle against some of those more dominant pass rushes. So they're definitely not a perfect team and maybe a more matchup dependent team as well. You know, the Ravens don't have this great pass rush and they played much better offensively in that one. Uh, but ultimately, still like the Bengals moving forward. And then uh, our number 11 team is going to be the LA Chargers, who are a very polarizing team. And I think what we're really learning about the Chargers here is that they have some pretty specific weaknesses here. And ever since I said on my podcast that we need to have a little bit of pump the brakes on the Chargers because they have some flaws. I talked about how they're very dependent on explosive plays offensively that just by nature, even if Justin Herbert is your quarterback, by nature, you are gonna have higher variance week to week on that stuff. You look at their offensive line situation, it is very shaky. And I think defensively, we've now seen three times that they struggle against more old school, disciplined, physical teams. It was the Cowboys early on, it was the Ravens last week where they got dominated, and now the Patriots taking it to them. So this team has some pretty clear weaknesses. I think they're very matchup dependent, but damn do they have some good strengths as well. And in other matchups, we will see the Chargers get back to driving the ball downfield and playing better defense. So I still like the Chargers. I still think they're a playoff team, but maybe just a few too many holes there and being a little bit too matchup dependent to be a true Super Bowl team. Okay, then the Raiders having a great bye week, climbing up four spots thanks to some disappointing performances from other teams here, uh, but still in a, in a group where I just don't consider them winning a Super Bowl. And I don't think I need to defend this as much because, you know, Raiders fans are going to get really pissed about that. But I ran a poll on Twitter and I think it was like 87% said, no, this team can't win a Super Bowl. And it's because I just don't trust the defense and I just don't trust Derek Carr to play at that level for four straight weeks. It can change. Everything can change um, with sample size and impressing me. That's why we watch all the games and we're always collecting new information. But this sample size of this unit playing elite defense or even just good defense and Derek Carr being this creative improviser perfect quarterback like he was against the Eagles I just need more of that before I trust it uh, so that's a tier of its own right there and then we have another uh, tier of three of flawed teams that I can actually picture winning a Super Bowl um, so then we have the Chiefs at number nine and they're going to climb up two spots before taking on the Giants I'm just not very panicky about the Chiefs quite yet. Uh, you're obviously disappointed in the, in the way that the season has played out thus far. But when, for the most part, you're talking about taking better care of the football and the impact that these turnovers have had in a lot of these games, uh, being, being something that I do think this team can uh, clean up at least a little bit. And some of these moves defensively with their personnel, I think they can go from this just melted butter defense where they can't swat a fly to at least a team that can get a few more sacks and interceptions and um you know play a little bit better defense so they're flawed don't get me wrong i'm worried about the o-line i'm worried about patrick mahomes playing in structure much more and i'm certainly worried about this defense so if you want to talk about them winning a super bowl this year they have a lot more to go but i still think patrick mahomes if they're playing the raiders tomorrow the Bengals, the chargers I'm going to take them to get the job done at this point in time. But again, if 
they look bad again against the Giants. That's more information that we'll have to collect, and I will reflect upon that on the podcast on Wednesday. Then we get the Titans at number eight. Very interesting game here because I, I didn't walk away from that feeling like the Titans played this amazing game. And they made some really big explosive plays there to A.J. Brown. Um, but Tannehill was not good in this game. They didn't run the ball. And defensively, you could say, yeah, they played really well. But honestly, they didn't play that well defensively. Carson Wentz was just gifting them the football. So that's one of those turnover heavy games where it's really difficult to know how much credit to assign to a defense. So they are going up one here. That was a huge win to persevere and beat a Colts team. But I don't walk away from that game feeling like all that much better about the Titans as I did last week. I think they're a really good team, though a little bit one dimensional. And then the Ravens as well. No new information for them as they were on by. So now we have my top NFL tier where we actually have six teams at the top of, to me, the the six true Super Bowl contenders right now, the teams that I can definitely see being in the Final Four and in that mix come you know, mid to late January there. Uh, so number six is going to be the Dallas Cowboys. I do think that was a very impressive win that is going to get them up into this top tier because we know that Dak is going to make this offense a lot better than they looked. But to see them really be able to lean on a lot of those strengths that they do have, talking about the run game, the defense that really did this against a, a good Vikings offense here. The pass rush was working. The run defense, very good. Micah Parsons, just so good sideline to sideline and limiting explosive runs, which is a big deal against some of these wide zone run teams and guys in the back end playing well. I thought Anthony Brown had a great game against Minnesota. So to see that working, the play calling working and, and the team to kind of rally uh, around Cooper Rush. I think really cool, just team win. We keep saying this about the Cowboys that yes, Dak is playing amazing, but what's really special about this team is that everything else is clicking into place around him. And then you put Dak in there and that ceiling goes whoop way up here. So I think the Cowboys have now entered the Super Bowl tier. I do still wanna see them beat someone else inside this group before they climb up ahead of some of these other teams that I think have better resumes, but the Cowboys now into that top six Super Bowl tier. Then we got the Arizona Cardinals, gonna drop down three spots, and this is a lot to do with J.J. Watt's injury. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that, of course, this team has been playing really good offensively all year. But one of the big surprises for the Colts, uh, sorry, for the Cardinals this season is how physical and tough that defense has been and, and frankly, how dominant that defense has been. Yet, you lose J.J. Watt, who is the heart and soul of any defensive line uh, from a leadership aspect and from an actual play on the field in the trenches uh, perspective. You lose him and then Green Bay comes into town and just bullies you into the dirt. Uh, and that's not like it's some dominant offensive line either. So I'm certainly worried about this team getting a little bit softer. I think you can also look at the injury there to Rodney Hudson at center and, and the pass protection breaking down a little bit more for the Cardinals. So I think they're getting to be a little bit more of that squishy, soft Cardinals team that they've been criticized of in the Cliff Kingsbury era. And I need to see them play that way, play the way they were playing before the J.J. Watt injury now that he is out. So I, I still like the Cardinals a lot. I think Kyler is right there in the MVP conversation, but this was his worst game of the season and uh, just in general, a down week for the Arizona Cardinals and perhaps a little bit of an I told you so moment for myself as I was very hesitant to put the Cardinals as the best team in the NFL. I think some of those weaknesses started to shine through a little bit now that they have a loss in the uh, right hand column. Okay, then the Buffalo Bills gonna stay put, taking care of business against the Dolphins. They are still to me the best team in the AFC and the only team in the AFC that's in this top tier. The defense continues to play incredibly well. And then offensively, I do think they're a little bit big play dependent and I wish they had a little bit more of a run game, but for the most part, the Bills are just incredibly sound and rolling at the moment. And then the Green Bay Packers jumping up two spots 
to my number three spot in the rankings. Starting to look a lot more like that team that I ranked two coming into the season, where I got a ton of crap for that, by the way. But a lot of things I talked about shaping up as far as Matt LaFleur being an underrated play caller, this pass rush being really sound, this quarters heavy scheme leading to a more solid, consistent defense that allows guys to play faster and, and, and play well. We've also seen the impact of low-level free agents making a bigger impact than people realize for the Packers because in the past, the Rasul Douglas and Devondre Campbells of the world, well, prior to Green Bay actually considering outside help in the event of injuries or poor depth on the roster, they would just go to some random practice squatter and then he would go and get obliterated by DeAndre Hopkins or insert good NFL player here. We're seeing countless players now step up guys like Campbell Douglas Whitney Merciless hell even a Jawan Winfrey Randall Cobb like those guys were non-existent in Packers teams years past now they're getting contributions from the depth at a much higher level oh and by the way David Bakhtiari is coming back they just got great great news on Zadarius Smith wasn't sure if he'd be back they're expecting to get Jair Alexander back Oh, and all their three receivers. So this is a huge win for the Packers. I feel like their season is only just kind of getting started. And uh, I think they need to open up some more explosive aspects of the offense. You know, Rodgers has been very kind of close to the belt. Nickel and dime you. Uh, let the run game beat you and then make a few plays on third down when he needs to. I still would like to see them have a high-powered offense before I put them ahead of these other two teams. But still, a huge week for the Packers and a statement win to say the least. Okay, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are not gonna be my number one team anymore, dropping down a spot. Now, I, I do think Antonio Brown being injured is an underrated critical cog for this team because they're still very good offensively, but I think that kind of deep to intermediate aspect of the field and the way that Brady's able to attack that with Antonio Brown not to mention that third layer where you have to worry about Godwin and Evans and then Antonio Brown. I think that's what really elevates this offense to that elite territory. I think you take him out of there, it's still incredibly good, but we're also seeing the defense falter much more this season with some of their injuries. Um, so I, I still think the Bucks are incredible and probably going to come in higher than most people have them still. Uh, but Needless to say, that was a, a disappointing loss for the Buccaneers and, and Brady showing some weaknesses this week as well. Really three, frankly, bad turnover-worthy plays that put this team in a tough spot. Uh, so he's having a great season, but you know that stuff can't happen. So the Bucs are going to come down too, and then I'm actually going to have the LA Rams, the number one spot. I just think this is the most complete team in football. They don't have any weaknesses right now. I think their defense, when you look at anyone in the top six here, is the most trustworthy. You got Donald and Jalen Ramsey as building blocks upon a well-coached, good unit. And then you throw in Sean McVay, who might be the best coach in football right now, a run game that works. The addition of Matthew Stafford with all of these receivers and Cooper Cup playing the way he's playing. Uh, right now, the Rams, to me, are the most well-balanced team in football. And part of that is health. This team somehow never gets injured. So... Good for Sean McVay. I don't know how he does it, but here's the Rams at number one, and that's my top tier for the NFL. Uh, so a lot to break down this week. Really excited to see what you guys think about the movement this week. Starting to get more and more information as we go, and uh, in, in some areas, I feel like we're learning less uh, with some of the chaos, like the Jets beating the Bengals. But uh, <laughs> really hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you for watching. We'll see you guys for the podcast on Wednesday. Also going to be doing my... Uh, mid-season prediction revisions uh, so that'll be a fun one and uh, an award a mid-season award ceremony as well so it'll be a fun podcast this week really looking forward to it and we'll see you guys then peace out